Jesus has been teaching all day. He's been teaching the crowds, preaching the big sermon, and then he takes his disciples aside and he gives them a private word. He says in verse 33 of Mark 4, with many such parables, he was speaking the word to them so far as they were able to hear it. And he did not speak to them without a parable, but he was explaining everything privately to his own disciples. So he calls his disciples aside after teaching the big crowd and says, let me speak to you and let me give you some stories that will give you spiritual truth for you to apply to your life. And he gave them some inside information. Beginning in verse 35, he tells his disciples, I want you to get on the boat and let us go, verse 35 says, to the other side. Leaving the crowd, they took him along with them in the boat just as he was and the other boats were with him. So let's get something straight as we start our journey. The disciples are smack dab in the will of God. Jesus said, get in the boat. They got in the boat after the sermon. They listened to the word. He said, get in the boat. They got in the boat. And they are doing exactly what they were told to do. They are perfectly situated. Not only are they in the will of God, Jesus is in there with them. Because it says Jesus got in the boat too. So it, life can be better than having church, hearing the word, and Jesus joins you in the boat. So Jesus is in the boat. They're going their way over to the other side. But while in the will of God and on the boat with the Lord, there's a problem. The problem is described in verse 37. There arose a fierce gale of wind and the waves were breaking over the boat so that the boat was already filling up. Now, many of these are professional fishermen, so they know how to handle water, boats, and storms. So when professional fishermen get scared, you know it's a big deal. This is a major lilac. And so they are caught in a storm while being in the will of God. So the first thing that you need to know is that in the will of God, it does rain. What tells you whether you're in a God, out of God's will is did you do what he tells you to do. But whether you did it or you didn't do it, you can still be in a lilac. That is a tumultuous situation. The other thing you need to know about this lilac is it's merciless. That is... It comes down on you and it seeks to consume you. The boat was filling up. The wind was blowing at such speed that it threatened to take them under. Anybody ever been in a situation that looked like it was going to take you under? That it was going to drown you? That it was going to overwhelm you? A storm, this kind of trial, is an unexpected circumstance that invades your life that threatens your very existence. We're not talking about a headache or a toothache here. We're talking about a situation where your life is on the line, where you don't know if you're going to make it or not. But let me tell you something else about a storm. A storm is always designed to increase your faith and give you a deeper experience with your God. Storms aren't pleasant, they aren't comfortable, and sometimes they can be life-threatening, but they always come with a purpose. So here they are in a crisis. They're in this crisis, and the crisis was threefold. There are actually three storms occurring here. Let me walk you through the three storms. First of all, there is a circumstantial storm, the lilac. I'll say one more thing about this circumstantial storm, and that is it was a storm over which they could exercise no control. You can't control the wind. You can't control the sea. You can't control the rain. You can't control the, the spinning of the turmoil. You can't control waves billowing up and going. You can't control that. That is out of your control. So you can be in the will of God and in a storm and absolutely be able to do nothing about it because you can't control a lilac. 
It's circumstances that produces a helpless and sometimes the feeling of a hopeless scenario. So that's storm number one. That leads to storm number two. Storm number two is that they were terrified. We know that they were terrified because Jesus is going to say to them, why are you afraid in verse 40? So they weren't scared, they were stirred. Now we're talking terrified. So now we not only have a storm of circumstance, we have a storm of emotion. Because their emotions have riveted up and they are scared about the doctor's report, scared about the financial struggle, scared about the, the relationship direction, scared, whatever it is that you can't control that's causing your emotions to be uprooted is your lilac. Because it's something so big, so deep, and so devastating, you can't control it. So the first storm are circumstances out of their control. The second storm is their emotional instability because of the uncontrollable circumstance. But there's a third storm here. We'll call it a theological storm. Because not only was their circumstance out of control, and now their emotions responding to their circumstance, they now have a spiritual storm a theological storm because the scripture goes on to say that they woke up Jesus and said in verse 38, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? See, that's a spiritual storm. Because their circumstances were out of control and their emotions have gone crazy, now they question whether what they have been believing is true. If the truth be told, and you would tell the truth and shame the devil, there aren't many of us who haven't questioned God, who haven't said, I'm not sure I should be believing this anymore. I'm not sure I could, should be continuing this. Because what I'm hearing on Sunday and what I'm experiencing on Monday don't match. I, I heard the preacher say that you care. <laughs> I don't see you caring for me. So what I heard about you and what I'm experiencing don't match and I'm not sure this is real. Because verse 38 says, Jesus himself was in the stern asleep on the cushion. They, they, they shook him and they said, don't you care? Because if you cared, we wouldn't even, have, even if you were tired, we wouldn't have to wake you up. You got you getting wet like we getting wet. The boat's flipping and flopping you like it's flipping and flopping us. And so they're in this storm. They're struggling. Jesus is asleep. And they had a question. Where were you? Do you, you don't care about me? If you cared about me, I wouldn't go and be going through this like this. Don't you care how bad was it that we are perishing? So this is major. We think we're going to drown out here and die. I'm going to die. Jesus had just taught the disciples. They just come from church, so to speak. And now they're under pressure. And it's tough. Does Jesus care about my pain, my finances, my loneliness, my hurt, my, my depression? Because I'm in his will and I feel all this. And so, they wake Jesus up. Verse 39, Jesus gets up and he rebukes the wind and says to the sea, hush your fuss. So Jesus is asleep, they wake him up. When they wake him up, he speaks to the circumstance that was causing the crisis. So don't let it be said your crisis continues because you never took the time to wake the Savior up. And so Jesus now turns to his disciples. Why are you afraid, verse 40, how is it that you have no faith? Why are you afraid and why do you have no faith? 
oh, I don't know Jesus. Maybe it's because we're getting ready to die. Because <laughs> in verse 35, Jesus said, let us go to the other side. Not let me go to the other side. We're going to make it to the other side. You left shouting. You were excited to get in the boat with me. But when the circumstances showed up, they overrode what I said. In other words, your problem overrode my promise. So you were now living in light of the problem, no longer living in light of the promise. And when you live in light of the problem and no longer in light of the promise, the problem will dominate you and it will totally erase the fact I ever made one. God never wants your circumstances. He doesn't want you to deny them. A storm is a storm. You don't call it a sunshine day. A storm is reality. But he never wants your circumstance to trump his word. Not only does he not want your circumstance to trump his word, he doesn't want your circumstance to trump his presence because he's on the boat too. And so Jesus speaks to the problem and when he speaks to the problem, there is a circumstantial change. Verse 41 says, they became very much afraid. When they were in the lilac, they were afraid. When they saw who they were dealing with, they became very much afraid. In other words, we're afraid of the wrong thing. <laughs> See, we let our circumstances scare us. He says, when you know who you're dealing with, <laughs> you'll be less afraid of that and more scared of me. Because shucks, if I, could tell the, if I could tell the storm to calm down, what can I do with you if I'm ticked off at you? I'll shut you, down, shut you out of here. No, if you're going to be scared, then what you need to be is scared more. Your fear ought to be toward who I am, not what the circumstance is. Because once I get up, all I got to do is talk to it. I wonder if anybody here ever seen God talk to a situation. You know, it was out of your control. Nobody you knew you could help you. You didn't have money to buy your way out of it. And, and God said something. Heaven spoke to it. And boom, suddenly, immediately, out of nowhere, that thing changed. So it's more important to, by faith, get Jesus dealing with the circumstance than you living in fear. Don't be scared of the wrong thing. When Jesus' humanity, his sleep, his deity stays awake. Who then is this? They were on a journey of discovery. Trials, as inconvenient and as painful as they are, are a journey of discovery of who you're dealing with. See, because too many of us still got him in a manger somewhere. Too many of us, too many of us don't, don't know who we're dealing with here. I mean, he's tired, so he got to go to sleep because he's human. He gets up and he puts the lilac to sleep because he's God. Okay? Because you know, he's human. And we, we call this in theology the hypostatic union. The hypostatic union means two natures in one person unmixed forever. Two natures in one person unmixed forever. So he's both human and divine. See, so God fertilized the egg of a woman. He fertilized the egg of Mary without a male sperm so that the Holy Spirit would provide the divine and Mary would provide the human so that the human and divine would be mixed in one person without sin forever. That's a hypostatic union. So, so one minute, he's thirsty, the Bible says. He said, I thirst. But the next minute, he's walking on water and, 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 and stopping storms and stuff. One minute, he says, I hunger. The next minute, he's taking sardines and crackers and making a folk Moby Dick sandwich to feed 5,000 men, not counting women and children, over 20,000 people. One moment, he died on a cross. Another moment, he raised him folk from the dead. Come on, who are you? What manner of man is this? 
Hebrews 4 says, and we have a high priest who is able to sympathize with our pain. How can you sympathize with my pain? Because I'm human. So I can feel what you feel the way you felt it. But I'm divine. See, when I go to you or you go to me, that's human to human. I may be able to sympathize but not be able to fix it. But when you deal with the God man, you're dealing with someone who can feel it and fix it. See, if you're if your obstetrician is a man who's delivering your baby, he can fix it, but he can't understand it. Because your male obstetrician has never known what it's like to be pregnant, know what it's like to be in labor, and know what it's like to give birth. Now, he can, he can fix it, but he can't feel it. But if your obstetrician is a female who also has children, they can feel it and fix it because they know what it feels like to be pregnant. They know what it feels like to be in labor. They know what it feels like to deliver, but because of their training, they know how to help you and know what it feels like while they help you. All a man can do is lie and say, I know how you feel. In fact, the next pregnant woman that has a baby and the doctor says, I know how you feel, say, stop lying, doctor. I ain't, I ain't here for your lies. You don't know how I feel. But a woman with a baby knows how you feel. But that training is enabling her to fix it. God says, because I'm a man, I know how you feel. But because I'm God, I can do something with it. What manner of man is this? That even the circumstances, nature obeys him. That nature has to succumb to him. So if you have a lilac, and if you don't have one, keep living. You will. The second most important truth you can learn about God is his sovereignty. The second most important thing you can learn about God is his sovereignty. The first thing that you should learn is the gospel. The good news of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and how faith in his finished work gives you, guarantees you, eternal life. But when it comes to now living your day-to-day -day life after having become a Christian, the most important thing for you to understand is God's sovereignty. To the best of my ability, I want to, based on his word, help us to understand and relate to this critical dimension of God that is in fact critical for every aspect of your life. Now, this is not a popular truth that we're going over today because men want God everywhere but on his throne. We live in a day when men want a jack-in-the-box God. When the grandkids come over the house, we've got this little thing you, we grew up with where you turn it and you play the music, and at the proper time, pop up comes the clown. And when the entertainment is over, he's pushed back in the box until the desire to be entertained again, and it's world around until it pops up again. What people today want is a God that will pop up conveniently when we want him or need him. And then when we're finished with him, he's put back in the box until such time as he's called upon to bless us, to forgive us, to help us, to encourage us. Oh, it's not that we don't want God, that we just want him conveniently. But to understand this doctrine, this understanding of God, will blow your mind. And if you understand it enough by the time we are finished and respond to it accordingly, it can also change your life. So what do we mean by the sovereignty of God? The sovereignty of God refers to God as absolute ruler, controller, and sustainer of all of his creation. 
To talk about sovereignty is to talk about rule or authority. And he sits on the throne of the universe. Everything he created, he rules over. And he created everything. What this means is that there is no now, person, place, thing, or thought that situates itself or operates outside of God's sovereignty. That there is nothing that escapes him, nothing that can override him, nothing that he is not fully aware of because he rules all things because he either causes all things to happen, one option, or he consciously allows things to happen. But there are no oops, mistakes, miss that one, or surprises. Because if it happened, he either made it happen, or he okayed it happening, even if he didn't directly cause it to happen. So let's get this straight. Nothing exists outside of the rule of God in your life, in this world, or in creation. The Bible says not one bird falls to the ground of which he is not fully aware and not one hair of one's head is lost, that he is not fully overseeing that. So he is not just sovereign in the sweet by and by, he's sovereign in the nasty here and now. He's sovereign in the big things and he's sovereign in the details. He is absolute ruler over all things. Job chapter 23 verse 13 says, God does what his soul desires. Job chapter 42 verse 2 says, no purpose of God can be thwarted or overridden. He will achieve his goals. Psalm 115 verse 3 says, God is in the heavens and he does whatsoever he pleases. Psalm 135 verse 6 says, God rules from the heaven and that even includes the fish in the sea. Nothing sits outside of sovereignty. God will always accomplish his purpose. What you do or do not do will never block God from getting to where he's designed to go. Okay? He will go with you, around you, or over you. But you will never interfere with his end result. God will always accomplish his purposes. Because God never limits himself to one route. This church is 11 miles from downtown Dallas. There is a preferred route to go to downtown Dallas, a direct line, 35 North. You get on 35 North, it will take you directly to downtown Dallas. That is the preferred route. That is the quickest route. But sometimes 35 North gets blocked with an accident, gets blocked with construction, and the route is no longer the convenient way to go. Well, because of Google Maps and other technology, you're not limited to 35. They will show you other options. If you know it, there are more than one options than your preferred route. God would prefer to accomplish his plan with your cooperation. That's what he would prefer. Because if he can accomplish it with your cooperation, everybody wins. But if you don't cooperate, don't think you were his only option. He's got multiple ways of accomplishing his goal. He can do it with you or without you. He can go around you or run over you. But no human being will thwart God's ultimate plan. You are his preferred route. Never his only route. And so when you understand that God's sovereignty does not negate your choice, it includes freedom to choose. You are free to choose. God didn't stop Adam and he's not going to stop you. 
He'll give you indicators, but, but he will let you choose because he made you with that, within certain limitations and boundaries. But you need to know when you choose against him, you have opened up the door for the manifestation of another attribute. Because God exists for his glory and the glory is the manifestation of his characteristics, perfections or attributes. God is so good at what he does. He is so good at what he does. He even uses evil to accomplish his goals. So even when folk are evil, he says, I can do something with that. Isn't this what Joseph said in Genesis 50 verses 19 to 21? You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good to bring me to this place. Guess how God got me here? God got me here by you boys getting jealous. God got me here by you selling me into slavery. God got me here by you accusing me of rape. God got me here by forgetting me in jail. God got me here from Pharaoh having a bad dream. And God didn't use all that mess to bring me to this place. And see, that's the good news about the sovereignty of God. He can take a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a little bit of the other and put it in his cosmic blender. By itself, it may not look like much. You take the flour by itself, it ain't much. You take the sugar by itself, it ain't much. You take the, the different ingredients of a cake by themselves, it's not much. But bake it right. And all those independent elements are joined together to accomplish something. That's why Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good to them who love God and are the called according to his purpose. He says, I prefer 35. Cooperate with me. He's so good at what he does as sovereign. He even uses the devil to help him out. That's as bad as you can get. That's as low as you can go. Because the devil is not the devil. The devil is his devil. (laughs) Peter, Luke 22. Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. Satan has made a request. Why? Because even the devil can't do anything without asking God first. And we're going to let him mess with you a little bit to to put you in your place. But when you have been converted, when your life gets right, when you stop trying to do this stuff on your own, when you learn your lesson, then I can use you. But I'm going to let the devil mess with you a little bit because you you ain't thinking right. You ain't acting right. You're not living right. So I'm going to let him blow you up until you get right. Then I can fix your life. The only reason Job's life fell apart was because the devil made a request of God and God okayed it. And the great apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he said there was a messenger sent from Satan to buffet me, to oppress me. And I went to God and I said, God, get the devil off my back. You ever said that to God? Get the devil off my back. He said, God, get the devil off my back. And God said, no. No, I'm going to let him ride you. Because I got to deal with something in your life that's a problem. And I need the devil to amplify it so that you see it, so that I can deal with it, so that you can get rid of it, so that I can do something special with you in a greater revelation. God is sovereign. And he rules. Within boundary, he allows choices. And according to Lamentations chapter 3, verse 37 and 38, he rules both the good and the evil. He rules both the good and the evil. Okay, now you understand sovereignty. You got a little handle on it. What does this mean? The first thing it means is that you change your vocabulary. First thing it means is you change your vocabulary and you X out the word luck. You cannot have sovereignty and luck. I know how we use it casually. We use it for everything. We got lucky dog. We got wish me luck. We got plain luck. We got luck be a lady. We got lady luck. We got tough luck, good luck, blind luck, bad luck, rotten luck, and then pot luck. We got luck for everything. You cannot have sovereignty and chance. 
You cannot have sovereignty and fate. You cannot have sovereignty and happenstance. You cannot have sovereignty and accidents. Because nothing sits out of sovereignty. So now when you get that straight, it changes your prayer life. When Paul says pray without ceasing, the reason why he can say pray without ceasing because now you've included God in everything. He's not included in everything because if he's in control of all the details, then the little things, the medium things, the big things are all God. So I'm talking to him all the time about everything. Sometimes formally, sometimes informally, sometimes walking, sometimes thinking, sometimes driving. I'm bringing him into everything. Why? Because he's sovereign over everything. Don't affect your prayer life. Now, now God is engaged everywhere. You are now looking for him everywhere. I love 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6. Because 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6 reads this way. Paul the apostle says, Yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for him. And one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we exist through him. Now he says two powerful things. He says, God the Father, we exist for him. God the Son, Jesus Christ, we exist through him. So we exist for God, and that is made possible through our relationship with Jesus Christ. So when you accept Christ, you now can exist for God. And you are now operating or designed to operate under his rule. And when you decide, when I decide, because we all have failed in that decision on various levels, but when we decide to align our lives under his sovereign rule, that's when you get to see how real he is in your life. Many of the problems that we are facing in our lives, with our strongholds, in our relationships, in our, in our careers, with our finances, are due to the fact that God is not allowed to rule in certain areas. We'll let him rule over here, but you better not touch over there. When we exist for him, that is the only reason you exist. You just get bonuses along the way. God is sovereign. So I close with, <laughs> with a passage that says it all. I, I can't improve on this one. Daniel chapter 4. And I'm going to read it and comment along the way. Because it says it all. You remember King Nebuchadnezzar. I'll call him Nebi for short. <laughs> Verse 28 of Daniel 4. All this happened to Nebuchadnezzar the king. Twelve months later, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. The king reflected. So he's walking on the roof and he's just thinking. He reflected and now we're told what he thought. He reflected and said, is this not Babylon the great which I myself have built? as a royal residence by the might of my power and for the glory of my majesty. So he's walking on the roof, smelling himself. <laughs> Says, is this not the great Babylon that I have built? You the man, you all that in a bag of chips. You, you, you look at what you done done, boy. While the word was in the king's mouth, while he was still talking to himself, a voice came from heaven saying, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is declared, sovereignty has been removed from you. What you just said, I just canceled. And you will be driven away from mankind and your dwelling place will be with the beast of the field. You will be given grass to eat like cattle. And seven periods of time, seven years, will pass over you until you recognize 
that the most high is ruler over all the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes. Immediately the word concerning Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled and he was driven away from mankind and began eating grass like cattle and his body was drenched with dew from heaven until the hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. He went insane. Verse 34, but at the end of that period, seven years, completion of time, Nebuchadnezzar raised his eyes toward heaven and my reason returned to me and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. What did you say, Nebuchadnezzar? For his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, but he does according to his will in the host of the heavens and among the inhabitants of the earth, and no one can ward off his hand. And at that time, my reason returned to me, and my majesty and splendor was restored for me for the glory of my kingdom. And my counselors and my nobles began seeking me out. So I was reestablished in my sovereignty and surpassing greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, honor the king of heaven for all his works are true and his ways are just and he is able to humble those who walk in pride. Every responsible man here ought to have a will. If you are a man and you have a family, you ought to protect their future. And that comes through having a will. A will is a legal document that says that what you have accumulated in your life, this is how you want it passed on to those that you leave behind. To not have a will is to say, I want somebody else to determine where what I have been able to accumulate, the assets of my existence, I want somebody else to determine where they go, how they are distributed, and where they wind up. But a responsible man wants to be ahead of that and make the determination of where their assets are to go. You see, to create a will is saying you are future-minded. You won't always be here. So you're going to be thinking about tomorrow, today, in your financial or asset planning. Unfortunately, what many do not understand is that there are not only wills of physical assets, there are wills of spiritual assets. What you pass on generationally that has spiritual value attached to it. And unfortunately, many men who don't even bother to pass on physical assets refuse to pass on spiritual assets, one or both, because they're not future-minded. And as a result of not being future-minded, there is chaos in the future because there was not clarity set forth in the present. The Bible has a lot to say about legacy about what is passed on to the next generation and beyond. In fact, Proverbs chapter 13 verse 22 says, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. Translation, a bad man leaves no inheritance to his children's children. So if there is no future planning, you cannot be dubbed a good man. Because a good man is not only thinking about 
what's happening with him today, but what will happen on a three-generational level. He's concerned about today, he's concerned about his children, and then he's concerned about his children's children, his grandchildren. So a man who's not three-generationally minded, God says is not a good man. Because he's not thinking long term. He may only be thinking about today as though tomorrow will never come. So every man, all of us as Christians, but specifically to men, a good man, has to be generationally minded at least three generations long for God to call you good. In a relay race, you call it passing a baton. You pass a baton. No matter how fast you run, if you drop the baton, you've ruined the race. Many men are successful who drop the baton. They've got things going for them that are never passed on. And then there are a whole another group of men who don't even bother to pick up the baton in the first place. And as a result, batons being dropped have created Chaos in families and in cultures. In Judges chapter 2 verse 10 it says that there grew up a generation who did not know Joseph, who did not know his God. And as a result, chaos ensued. And when you read the book of Judges, you have a culture in perpetual chaos because there was a transfer of the spiritual baton that did not occur. In fact, the book of Judges says, and every man did that which was right in his own eyes because there was no king in those days. There was no standard that had been passed on. Today we live in a day of societal chaos. And that chaos can be rooted back to Men who refuse to build a spiritual legacy. Men who refuse to man up to God's requirement for biblical manhood. And like it or not, God starts withholding the man responsible for how the legacy works out or does not. God says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he never says, I am the God of Sarah, Rebecca, and Rachel. It's not because he's against the women, it's just that the man was responsible. The whole condemnation of the human race is tied to a man. The Bible says, in Adam all die. Doesn't say in Adam and Eve. Only in Adam, the man, all die. That is because the man was held responsible. So like it or not, want it or not, that's just the way it is. And so we're introduced in this boring passage of scripture to a man named Asher. Verse 30 says, Asher had four sons and one daughter. Asher was the father of five children. And when we end the story of Asher, as you'll see, he comes out pretty good. But he didn't start that way. You see, Asher is the seventh son of Jacob. If he's the seventh son of Jacob, that means he's been raised in a dysfunctional family. Because as far as Jacob's family was concerned, Papa was a rolling stone. Wherever he laid his hat was his home. Jacob created chaos in his family. Asher, the seventh son of Jacob, participated with his brothers in putting Joseph into the pit. So he was part of the conniving group of siblings that wanted to ruin their brother's life. His daddy, Jacob, was known as the trickster or deceiver. He knew how to game. And so he played games all of his life and that rolled over to his children. 
So Jacob, the patriarch, created havoc in his family due to his deception. It rubbed off on his boys. His boys destroyed or tried to destroy one of their brothers. He wasn't raised in a good, healthy home environment. It wasn't the kind of environment that would have been inducive to an orderly family structure. There are men here, and since he had a daughter, there are women here who have been raised in dysfunctional families. Your papa was a rolling stone. Wherever he laid his hat was his home. Or you grew up without a father, or he might as well not been there as a father. And there was all kinds of dysfunction in the family that you grew up with. Perhaps there are siblings now you cannot relate to because of the chaos in your home. Well, before you ever get to 1 Chronicles chapter 7, that's Asher. That's his history and his background. It's not a pretty one. But somewhere along the line, there was a transformation that occurred in the life of Asher. Because when we read about him here in chapter 7, we're going to give you some good news. Especially the men, but the principle applies to all of us, is that your past doesn't have to determine your future. That no matter how messed up your yesterday was, does not have to control what your tomorrow will be like. That you have an option to change your legacy. And that the legacy bequeathed to you does not have to be the legacy you dispense to others. Whether it is your immediate family, whether it's your siblings or those who come under your influence. Such is the case with the change and transformation that took place in the life of Asher. Well, let's go to verse 40. All these, verse 40 says, were the sons of Asher, heads of the father's houses. They became leaders in their family. Whatever Asher did when he got right, so influenced his four boys that they were able to take up responsible reigns in their own families. The Bible teaches that the man is to be the head. That means the man is the one responsible. That's not just saying you're the boss. It says you're responsible. If stuff going left, you're responsible. If the kids are acting crazy, you're responsible. If the wife is off, you're responsible. You may not be to blame. It may not be your fault. But headship means responsibility. You got to own it. When I have a couple that are getting ready to get married and the wife has all these bills and she's bringing in. And I had one couple, the man said, we're going to get married when she paid them bills. I had to help a brother out. I say, do you love her? Yes. Do you want to marry her? Yes. When do you want to marry her? I really want to marry her now. Well, there's a simple question. Are you willing to own it? Or are you willing to say, yes, they were your mills, but they're now my responsibility? Because to be a head of a household in the Bible, maybe not in the culture, but in the Bible means you're willing to own it. Headship is responsibility. Headship also involves direction, whether it's a president or the head of a company or the head of a church or whatever. Headship means you are casting a direction so that people know which way we're going. To be a head means that I want to be in close proximity with God so that God can speak to me by his Holy Spirit and give me direction so that those following me will have a place to go. Joshua says in Joshua 24, 15, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I'm going to set the spiritual, which is the most important, the foundational, the biblical direction 
And what that means is that you're not following the crowd. You're not picking up your direction from television. You're not picking your direction from social media because you're God's man. So you're picking up your cues from him. When Moses sent the 12 spies into the promised land, 10 spies came back and said, they're giants in the land. Oh, we can't do this. Them people too big in there. They're giants in the land. Joshua and Caleb came back and said, oh no, God has already spoken. And we're going to follow God because while y'all see giants, we see grasshoppers. See, it all depends on what you're looking at. That'll determine what you see. And if you do not have a divine perspective, all you see is what you see, which means you won't see all there is to be seen. That if you're going to be God's head of household and raise the boys to be head of households, we have a generation of men who've abandoned their households, forcing the women to be head of households. Because they refuse to be, or even if they're, they do not take the spiritual responsibility. And being God's man is not necessarily a popular position. You will regularly be outnumbered. But this is not a popularity contest. This is a responsibility. A biblical headship is a responsibility that you take on, that you own, because you have been placed there. We live in a day of male abandonment where men are increasingly refusing to own it. Maybe it's because your father didn't own it. Maybe it's because your mother was domineering. Maybe it's because of negative influences in the culture. Whatever the reason is, it's time to come back home to God. Asher turned that thing around and whatever caused them to turn it around, because we know the boys got right at the end, whatever caused them to turn it around, that must mean that you must now be willing to accept a passionate purpose. See, you got to get excited about your role. You don't just live in it. You got to get fire up under you. See, a, a space shuttle is on a launching pad. That's mean it's sitting there trying to go somewhere. It's supposed to shoot up in outer space. But right now it's just sitting. And the reason it's been sitting is because it ain't, there's no fire up under it yet. It hasn't been, the fuel hasn't been ignited to send it off the pad to accomplish its space mission. We got too many men on the pad. Just sitting there talking about I'm the head. <laughs> what God wants to do is light the fire so that you take off and go somewhere. That means you must become fired up about your headship in a responsible, loving, and appropriate way. So Asher recovered in some way and he raised his sons to be heads of households with fire and vision. If you're going to be the head, you just can't see the acorn. You got to look at the oak. You got to see bigger than what is, yeah? Things are not looking good, but, but me and God got to get together and we got to find out how he wants us to fix this, correct this. 
straighten this, reorient this. Why? Because you just said you the man. You say you the man. Well, if you the man, you got the man up. He says, they were mentored, they were raised as princes, that is, positioned for future kingship. And so the question is, what level of mentoring are we giving our kids? And remember, to the third generation, our grandkids. Many a young man has been spiritually castrated because he's not been given a sense of his royal standing in the family and most importantly with the Lord. They've been duped and ripped. 